Hello everyone and welcome back to Rich History. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at the famous M1 helmet. We're going to take a look at some of the characteristics by which you can identify the era of the helmet, then at the end we're going to apply them and take a look at a few examples. The first clue can be found in the rim. Around the edge of every M1 helmet, there's a metal rim, and where the two ends meet, there's a small slit called the seam. From 1941 to late 1944, the seam was in the front, as you can see here. In 1944, production switched to having a rear seam, which is how the helmets will continue to be produced until the 1980s. This means that all helmets with a front seam are World War II era, while helmets with a rear seam could date anywhere from late World War II um, up until the early to mid 80s. The next thing that we're gonna look at is the type of bales that the helmet have. The bales on the helmet are the little rectangular pieces of metal that hold the chin strap in place on each side of the shell. From 1941 to 1943, helmets were fixed bale, which meant that the bales were welded directly onto the side of the shell, stationary, they couldn't move. Eventually it was realized that fixed bale helmets uh, would eventually have the bales actually break off. So in 1942, what was called a swivel bale was developed, which allowed more flexibility. As you can see here, helmets were made with a swivel bale up until the end of production, as you can see here on this 80s helmet. Another great defining characteristic on the M1 helmet is the heat stamp. The heat stamp is a lot number that is printed on the lip of the helmet underneath the brim, which tells you what production run the helmet was made in, generally speaking. As the heat stamp indicates what production run the helmet was a part of, you can often use the number to help you determine what year the helmet was produced, sometimes even what month the helmet was produced. I'll link some great sources in the description to help you decipher the heat stamp on your helmet. Another difference between wartime and post-war shells is the actual profile of the dome. Uh, on World War II shells, um, generally speaking, like the one on the left, they're gonna have a taller uh, dome. Uh, it's kind of hard to show the difference on the camera here, but you can kind of see that there's, like a, there's a noticeable difference between the uh, wartime dome and the uh, post-war dome. I say generally speaking because companies started experimenting with different manufacturing techniques of lower domes uh, towards the end of the war. Here in this great diagram from J.R. Murray, you can see the differences between the McCord and the Schluter helmet. Uh, lower dome helmets were experimented with because they proved uh, better um, under stress over time and they fared uh, better in ballistic tests. This is a great time to note that J.R. Murray's uh, Big Red blog and Military Trader have some great articles that really get into the nitty gritty about details of the M1 helmet. I'll link those in the description. Another characteristic of a helmet that you can look at is the chin strap type. From 1941 to 1942, the buckles were made out of brass. Then eventually it was replaced with a steel buckle, which was painted black. This is how it would remain for the remainder of World War II. Then in the 70s, the buckle was done away with completely and was replaced with a snap. During World War II and into Korea, the chin strap was sewn directly onto the bale, but as you can see, it would eventually get worn down and would break. As a result, in the 1950s, a metal buckle was uh, developed, which would attach the, the chin strap to the bale, uh, which reduced the risk of breaking. Then in the 70s, it was further developed into these angled metal pieces, which as you can see, would attach right to the chin strap. Another good general rule of thumb is that the darker the webbing on the chin strap is, the later it probably is. Something that I have to note is that just like patch identification, you have to take all these factors into account with each other. Uh, sometimes not each one by themselves is absolute. For example, uh, a World War II shell with World War II chin straps um, could have the chin strap break and then be replaced with later chin straps and be re reissued at a later date. Um, fixed bales could break off and be replaced with swivel bales. Um, a helmet could be painted and then reissued um, far later than its production date. Um, it really depends and you have to keep an eye out for clues of these different uh, things that could happen to the helmet. Now that we have some tricks up our sleeve, let's take a look at some helmets and see if we can determine the era based on the characteristics that I just showed. Let's take a look at this shell for example. Front seam, fixed bale, early heat stamp, and early style chin straps. Also note the interesting wear that the helmet has on it. The helmet also has the remains of soap suds on the inside. This is a good example of an early World War II shell that most likely saw some good service during World War II. Let's take a look at another one. Rear seam, swivel bale, later war style chin strap, and a high dome profile. 
What you don't see is that this helmet was issued with a 1952 liner, which means that it is most likely a late World War II shell that was used by an officer during the Korean War time frame. Let's try one last shell. Rear seam, swivel bail, World War II chin strap, and high dome profile. Once again, we most likely have a late World War II helmet. Interestingly enough, this helmet has MP markings for the DC National Guard, and on the other side, it has a 171, which is in reference to the 171st Military Police Battalion. Well guys, that about wraps it up. Thanks for watching as always, and if you have any questions, um, leave them in the comments. There's a few more details that I'd like to touch on, so I'll try to make some shorts when I get the chance, and I'll see you guys next time.